Good afternoon. I'm Shannon Derejo from Crema Media. Welcome to today's webinar, where our panel of speakers will unpack the importance of investing in the future of South Africa's water infrastructure. A strong and sustainable water system, as well as the development of the critical skills necessary to address the country's water challenges, can ensure access to clean and reliable water for generations to come. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Energy and Water Sector Education and Training Authority, Lebalelo Water User Association, Xylem, M&D Construction, the South African Plastic Pipe Manufacturers Association, Press Tank, Enterprises UP, and GLS Consulting. We thank our sponsors for making this event possible. Before we begin, please be aware we have enabled the Q&A function, so please post any questions into the Q&A box. You'll find this on the panel at the bottom of your screen. The facilitator will pick out themes in the questions and answer as many of them as possible throughout the discussion. To encourage interaction, we've also enabled the chat function. You'll find this at the bottom of your screen. Please don't, however, post any questions in the chat box as we may miss them. You can post all your questions into the Q&A instead. Please be aware we are recording this webinar and we'll be sending the recording to you when it's available. We're also streaming the webinar live on YouTube and we'll share the link in the chat shortly. Today's webinar will be facilitated by Desigan Naidu, head of the African Climate Risk and Human, Human Security Program at the Institute for Security Studies. He's also a World Bank Senior Advisor and Climate Adaptation Lead to the South African Presidential Climate Commission. He was previously the CEO of the Water Research Commission for 10 years. Desigan will facilitate the discussion with our panel, which consists of Mpo Mukupele, the CEO of the Energy and Water Sector Education and Training Authority, Bartis Birman, the CEO of the Lebalelo Water User Association, Dr. Sean Phillips, Director General at the Department of Water and Sanitation, and Sean Power, Sustainability Manager at PepsiCo South Africa. I'll hand over now to our facilitator, Desigan Naidu, to start the discussion. Over to you, Desigan. Thank you, Shannon, and good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us in what we hope is going to be quite a stimulating discussion. Uh, we have a very powerful panel today, and so uh, we have the opportunity to challenge us, uh, challenge them to get us to the right solution tree that we want to see. Where we find ourselves in the world today, where we find ourselves in South Africa, as far as water is concerned, is a difficult space. Climate change and climate-related extreme weather events have become a phenomenon of our time. We need to redefine the standards around these. We no longer talk about one in 120 year flood events because those events are actually happening every year. We are simultaneously having droughts and floods in the same systems and high energy storms have become the order of the day. Alongside this, we have an unreliable water supply also driven by other factors. One of those factors is poorly maintained infrastructure. Even the infrastructure that is not aging and old is not adequately functioning because we have the difficulty of the maintenance problem. We have less than adequate water conservation and demand management inside the system right now. And we're not taking sufficient advantage of the research development and innovation that is available to South Africa and in some places where South Africa even leads in the world. So if you like, we're trying to solve a 21st century problem with 20th century technology and sometimes 19th century operating rules. And then behind all of this is the scepter of the energy crisis, the lack of electricity. And the energy water nexus is a very old one and one of high codependencies. These have now come to characterize what water is in South Africa today. And it comes from a past, ironically, that was characterized by something else. I mean, the Mandela Asma legacy in water law is world renowned. Um, it's repeated in every forum that one engages in the international water space. Based on the human rights-based approach to water, the whole notion of free basic water and water as a human right, as espoused then in the MDGs and after that in the SDGs, water as a tool for transformation, water as the enabler 
for growth and development. So this difficult space where we find ourselves, does this mean that we have lost our way or is this just a temporary setback? Is this the bottom of the barrel and the only way is up? Is this the wake up call that stimulates the actions that puts us out of this difficulty initially and then eventually on a path to climate resilient water prosperity? I think we have just the right people in this room on this panel to engage those questions in a meaningful way. So I'm gonna switch just now immediately to the panel, but the format that we're gonna to follow today is that we're gonna have some initial comments from the panel around their initial gambits and we may have a to and fro to clarify some issues. We're then gonna open up to the folk uh, through the Q&A mechanism to get your inputs in and then we're gonna to return to the panel both to respond to the issues that you raise and in addition to that, of course, their closing statement. So we're looking forward to a very vibrant discussion and one that will be definitive around the way we go forward. So with that, I wanna to switch to our first panelist and that's Mpo Mokopele, who is from the Electricity and Water CETA and is a very important bridge between two of the codependent issues that I have uh, raised who has the responsibility to organize not only for our current capacity inside the system, but maybe more importantly, to ensure that we have the right capacities going into the future so we are able to achieve this water prosperity. And Paul, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for inviting me into the session um, and to this important discussion. I thought you were going to, to, to start with the chief of water. <laughs> Um, but I'm happy that for once, skills come first. Um, and that's really my opening statement. Um, often, skills development in people become a topic in a conversation after significant plans have been made, and especially talking of infrastructure. Um, whether energy or water, I mean the energy and the water, not electricity. I know we have a challenge with electricity now, but we are energy and water, Sita. And our main mandate is ensure that we have a clear understanding of the skills needs for the energy and the water sector, working with the industry, of course, with the two sectors. And once we have a clear understanding and a picture of what South Africa requires for that um, water prosperity country, um, is to work together to ensure that we're building capabilities for the country to respond to the challenges, or not even only the challenges, just to respond to the skills needs in the, the two sectors. So talking water infrastructure, um, what can happen is that we, all, because this is such a complex and a very expensive discussion, we can get stuck in the financing of infrastructure and what infrastructure and sourcing of, of, sourcing of infrastructure, um, policies around infrastructure, and uh, we forget people um, as part of that conversation. I think we've seen it in some of the previous conversation and I'm going to just, from an energy perspective, uh, we, we focus a lot of, on generation and we don't sit on transmission and only later on we start talking transmission. Um, we don't um, talk things in holistically and look at integration of things. So talking infrastructure can be a, like I said, a complex discussion, but without human capital, um, this is, for me, I equate it as talking infrastructure for the sake of dumping that infrastructure. Um, infrastructure planning requires a skill. Policies around infrastructure for the country requires human capability who are able to set policies um, and interpret policies, implement policies um, in a country so that we can see that infrastructure plans materialize. materialize. Um, we often say South Africa has great policies um, that are even borrowed by the outside world, but we have a challenge in implementing and what, what, what lies behind implementation of policies? It's people. Um, and so people are very important, are key to an infrastructure discussion. The water risks reports in the past years and the energy risk report, at the center of mitigation, risk mitigation is people. Um, we, they talk about innovation, we talk about maintenance, we talk about procurement, but at the center of all these things is people. And I think our posture towards people and skills development in our country um, needs to sort of shift away from um, a social exercise, but to be seen as a strategic element of planning um, for the water sector. 
So ours uh, at EWCTA is to ensure that we are work working with the water sector, the partners who are in the room, to have clarity on the skills that are required to drive the water sector to success. And I think just the people in the room, if we were to talk about our own companies, we might have a picture of what our own companies require. But if we were to collate an entire picture of South Africa, do we have a good picture of the skills not to manage the current challenges, but do we have a good picture um, of the proper skills that are required in our country to drive this sector out of where it is right now into where we want to see the water sector in our country? And if we don't have that clear picture, we, we are not managing the real risk. Um, infrastructure, uh, I know I only have five minutes. Um, if you give me a platform to preach, um, that's the problem. Um, infrastructure is, like I said, is very expensive. And if you hand that over to people who do not know what to do with that infrastructure, we are going to continue to see the challenges that we see often that we significantly invest in assets, but those assets are given to people who can't manage them, or we don't even look into um, assessing ourselves whether those people, we've got adequate uh, capabilities in our country. So there are two things for me that I just wanna highlight on. Clarity on the vision, the water vision for the country, which I think the Department of Water and Sanitation um, is where it has put together for the country, but clarity in that vision. And once we've got clarity in the vision for the sector, do we have a picture of the skills that are able to bring that vision into fruition? And if we don't have that picture, we're going to keep running artisanal pro programs, we're going to keep running skills development programs in different areas, but not really getting to seeing um, the impact of, uh, of human investment in human capital in our country. Uh, the topic is investment in water, infra water infrastructure. I want to just add on there also investment in human capability. It's not a social invest it's not a corporate social investment it's a strategic investment because you can't run infrastructure with people um you've talked about innovation so what we also look at is inclusion um inclusion of women within the space inclusion of people who are within the communities within the space we also look at inclusion of those who are um not necessarily involved meaningfully involved in the water economy um, uh, so from an EWC perspective, we do partner with a number of our stakeholders to look at how do we bring about innovation from um, the communities where challenges are being experienced um, using what they have so that we resolve some of the water challenges in our country. I know that might not really directly link to major infrastructure, but this is where we start seeing the talent and the know-how that is coming from South Africa that can result in us even um, producing our own solutions as a country, um, as opposed to constantly borrowing solutions. Um, WRC, DWS, and innovation hubs um, in our country are constantly working on water solution and water technologies um, and water innovation, but we're struggling to see this uptake and this realize into something that is material. So that's the conversation. People are key to infrastructure. Without people, money into infrastructure is actually money into waste. Hmm. Thank you very much indeed. That's a that's a great introduction to the topic, and and I'm sure folk are going to uh, pull you in on this nexus between water and energy and how the skills play in that space. But now let me go to DG Sean Phillips. Uh, Sean, uh, the sector looked upon you as a revelation after a long hiatus of temporary. Uh, people in charge is the first, if you like, permanent DG, and you have been busy around reorganizing the sector. Tell us, what does the future look like? How are we going to be able to get to where we need to be? Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Deshikan, and good afternoon to all the participants, fellow panelists. Firstly, I'd like to agree with Impo. When we um, issued our blue and green drop and no drop reports, in de December last year for the first time in 10 years. There was a very interesting finding in the Blue Drop report, and that was that skills are as important, if not more important, than the condition of infrastructure as a determinant of drinking water quality. So for example, we found that those municipalities with the poorest results in terms of drinking water quality also had the highest level of shortage of skills, of the required skills, such as qualified process controllers. 
and those municipalities with the best performing drinking water systems in terms of water quality had the lowest shortages of the required skills. So that statistic really underlines the points that uh, Impo is making. Sometimes we get too caught up in the issue of infrastructure and, the, and don't pay enough attention to the softer issues, which are often much cheaper to address than infrastructure, such as getting the required skills in place and making sure that the required treatment processes are followed. Uh, but uh, water is essentially different from electricity in that it's a much more of a localized issue. Uh, there isn't a national water grid like there's a national electricity grid. And there's different reasons for different water shortages or water supply disruptions in different localities. There are currently areas of the country where the main reason for water supply disruptions is an insufficient supply of raw, untreated water. And Gauteng is one of those areas. Etiquini and surrounding municipalities is another area. Due to a long period of instability in the National Department, as you alluded to, Deshigan, many of the key water resource infrastru infrastructure projects that were planned to make sure that we didn't have such water shortages have been delayed, including Lesotho Highlands Phase 2, which is aimed at providing additional water for Gauteng and the Omkamazi Dam for Etiguini. The good news is that the, all of those projects have now been unblocked and implementation and the pending establishment of the National Water Resource Infrastructure Agency will enable more finance to be raised in the markets for such projects. But it does mean, for example, in Gauteng, that until the Sutu Highlands Phase 2 comes online on, in 2028 or 2029, we have to take a number of measures to try and minimize the risks of water supply disruptions while the demand supply situation is very tight because there isn't sufficient water in the integrated Vile River system. But having said that, there are limits to which we can keep building dams to provide affordable water in South Africa. We have already captured more than 75% of the, of the available surface water resources in the country. We're a water scarce country and we need to use water more sparingly. If we to, are to avoid water shortages becoming a constraint to economic growth in future, we need to do a number of things. We need to capture our remaining surface water resources, and there isn't much of that, and the remaining opportunities are becoming increasingly expensive. We also need to reduce physical losses in municipal distribution systems, and we need to have much more effective water conservation and demand management awareness campaigns, which I think you also referred to, Deshigan, drawing on the successful experience of Cape Town when it faced day zero. By the way, they, they have managed to sustain their much reduced average consumption of water in terms of liters per capita per day that they achieved from day zero. They still have the lowest um, consumption levels in the country, which means that they did something which worked with their awareness campaign around treating water as a scarce resource in Cape Town. And then the other thing that we must do is diversify the water mix with increased water wastewater reuse in our cities, with uh, increased seawater desalination in our, in our coastal areas, and more use of groundwater, but making sure that it's used sustainably. By their nature, many of these options for diversifying the water mix will need to be implemented by municipalities. Boreholes, seawater desalination, wastewater reuse are local, very localized forms of technology. Um, so at least there's going to be a, have to be a high level of municipal involvement in it. That means that municipalities will become increasingly important for ensuring an adequate supply of raw water in addition to their current main focus of delivering treated water services. However, the blue, green and no-drop reports that were issued by us last year indicate that municipal water and wastewater services have generally declined sharply over the last 10 years in terms of indicators such as the quality of water provided, the quality of effluent from wastewater treatment works, and the level of physical losses in non-revenue water. These reports also identify the key causes of the decline, including weak billing and revenue collection, insufficient prioritization of budgets for maintenance by municipalities, and insufficient employment of staff, such as process controllers with the required qualifications. Now, this decline in the delivery of municipal water service services has taken place despite very high levels of support from the national government to municipalities, including more than 60 billion rand per annum in grants to municipalities for water and sanitation infrastructure and for free basic water for the indigent. 
as well as substantial technical, financial, and other capacity building support. And this indicates that su while support is necessary, it's not sufficient to turn around the decline in municipal water services and structural reform of the municipal water services function is also required. The solution is not for national government to take over the municipal water function. We have to make our municipalities work better. Reforms need to be aimed at ensuring that municipal water services become professionally run and financially sustainable. And that will require legislative and regulatory measures, such as those that we've proposed in the draft water services amendment bill, which is currently out for public consultation and which introduces a requirement for municipal water service providers to have an operating license um, and for water services authorities to only appoint or approve water service providers which have an operating license. And the aim of that is to ensure minimum capability levels for water services providers. But we think other reforms are also required, some which might have to be led by other departments such as National Treasury. For example, we think it's important for the revenues from the sale of water at municipal revenue uh, at municipal level to be ring fenced for expenditure on water services. Currently, municipalities can spend those, can municipal councils can vote for those revenues to be used for any function and not necessarily on the water function. And then uh, national government also may, needs to introduce regulatory and legal measures to professionalize uh, the municipal public service more than is currently the case. Finally, there are still areas of the country where there are communities which have never had access to water services. So while the backlog and access has improved from approximately 55% in 1994, sorry, there was actually access. 55% um, of the population in 1994 had access to a minimum level of water services. That has improved to 90% today. But there are still, that 10% of people is still about five or six million people who've never had access to even a basic level of water services. Um, and that remains a priority for us to address that remaining 10% in addition to addressing the decline in the reliability of supply to those who do have access. Thank you, Deshikan. Thank you very much, DG. That was a, a wide coverage in a short space of time. Uh, appreciate how well you, you did that. And there's a whole bunch of issues emanating from what you said that I think we'll pick up in the discussion just now. Uh, I'm going to move over now, just keeping in, in the public space a little bit before we go to the private sector space. Uh, and, and we move over to Bertus Birman. Bertus, you are the CEO of a water user association, a very important one. So maybe uh, just before you offer your, your viewpoints, maybe you want to just remind people of what a water user association is. Over to you, sir. Thank you uh, for the opportunity, uh, Desigan, uh, to share uh, a Levelello collaborative model. And as, uh, as we talk about it, uh, the Water Users Association, Levelello specifically, was established in 2002 in terms of the National Water Act, whereby the members can manage their own water supply and infrastructure according to a constitution and members agreement as described by the Act. Lebeleno is a unique water users association as it developed a collaborative model uh, whereby two categories of members have been agreed, namely the institutional members that will consist of DWS, the Water Board, and the Water Service Authorities on the one hand, uh, and the commercial members consisting of mines and industries on the other hand, all of that within its area of operation. The model allows uh, Lebelelo to actually become a special purpose vehicle uh, acting on behalf of its members for the development of a 25 billion rand water infrastructure program called the Olifants Management Model Program in the Limpopo province. The scope of the pro, uh, program entails approximately 200 kilometers of 
bulk raw water pipelines, uh, 650 kilometers of potable uh, uh, bulk uh, water pipelines, and in the vicinity of 1,500 kilometers of potable reticulation pipelines, uh, and all the associated infrastructure uh, work that. Uh, this uh, project will uh, provide uh, 16, 16 mining companies with raw water, but the important thing is it will also provide 390,000 people with potable water on a yard connection basis. These areas are mostly rural, uh, surrounding the mining uh, industry, and therefore uh, uh, the mining industry and the, the um, pipeline itself. The model is built on uh, a few principles. Uh, shared capital contribution between the member categories, shared control and liability, uh, strong governance satisfying both the uh, public and the private uh, member requirements, uh, where you're looking at, you know, in terms of government, we're not uh, part of the PFMA, but all our requirements uh, fulfill the requirements of the PFMA, but also with our commercial members being part, you know, uh, and uh, of the JSE and other stock exchanges have their own requirements that one has to uh, uh, adhere to. Importantly, this is a non-profit implementer and operator, uh, which in terms of that would provide the lowest possible cost in terms of tariffs, but also in terms of the provision of this, the services. A very important part of the program is a socioeconomic development program that ensures uh, inclusivity and benefits for the surrounding communities. Not only the fact that they would get potable water, but also that they would get other services and we can, if there's time later, talk about those uh, uh, services that they can uh, uh, get. A bespoke track record, uh, Lebelelo is now operating for the past uh, 22 years, uh, and also were able to construct uh, their own infrastructure and maintain it over the period with a uh, zero downtime in the, the past uh, period. Part of, of this uh, program is also a program management unit uh, with uh, highly developed skills, experience, systems, and tools. And I think also if I come back to what Sean and Mpu said, one of the issues that we will address is operational readiness training, where water uh, infrastructure that will be developed within the municipalities will also benefit from at least then the operational readiness training and also a uh, oversight function from Lebelelo, uh, which will help to ensure that if there is any issues with maintenance or operations, that there is uh, uh, help close by should they require it. Thank you. Bertus, thank you very much indeed. And that's quite an interesting model. Uh, just now in the Q&A, uh, we're going to encourage some of the other panelists to offer an opinion around that because it clearly has some potential. Colleagues, uh, there are almost 150 of you that are on this uh, seminar right now, and welcome again to all of you. Can I please encourage you to go to the Q&A function, because that's what we're going to be using to engage the panelists. I know you're putting a lot of comments in the chat. 
it's not going to be so easy to capture it from the chat. So if you can put that summary of the question in the Q&A, that would be highly appreciated. We now move on to our last panelist before getting to that Q&A. And now we have somebody who is from not just the private sector, but a very significant water user in the private sector and beyond a water user, a water player in the private sector. And that, that's PepsiCo. And we have, um, we have Sean Powers from PepsiCo who has joined us today. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Deskin, and good afternoon to you, the panelists and uh, the audience. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. And I thought I'd start with a bit of an introduction to the company. Uh, just give you an overview of of who we are, where we operate, and what we what we produce, and therefore what our our role in the the water sector is, and our relationship with the water sector is. So, PepsiCo has had a history in South Africa going back to, I believe, about nineteen ninety six, uh, the late nineties, uh, through essentially the Simba and Lay's brands. But the family of of brands has grown significantly over the years, particularly with the recent acquisition of Pioneer Foods. So you might know PepsiCo South Africa more through the brands of uh, series fruit juices, Bacomo cereals, so, uh, products like Pronutro, Wheat Bix, uh, Breads, the Sasco family. Uh, we also produce uh, the Safari brands, so dried fruit and nuts. Uh, and then obviously the snack side of the business, uh, the the Simba, Doritos, Knickknacks, Ghost Pops, uh, those those brands. So I think you that you and the, the the balance of the the audience will probably be very familiar with those, and that's that's really where the, the the heart of the business is in South Africa. Is it's a it's a, it's predominantly a foods business, and therefore uh, our relationship with the, the the water sector is 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 really important for us and fundamental not only for producing our raw materials on the farms, you know, be it the potatoes or corn or uh, uh, wheat or maize corn and maize that we produce our, our products with. But um, but in, in in processing and manufacturing our, our finished goods in in the, the facilities that we operate in, uh, we have just over forty facilities distributed around the country. So we see a fairly broad view on the water, uh, the status of water security and water risk around the country, depending on where we operate. But it is everywhere from um, Uppington to to Polokwane to Durban to Cape Town and, and and many places in between. So we do have a a, a big footprint and and yeah, we we're proud to be um, a, a player in the industry and want to and want to be an, an active and uh, positive influence on the water sector. So we recognise that that water is critical for the health and safety of of our employees and our communities. Right, uh, we we can't produce the products to the the standard we need to or um, uh, or depend on. Uh, without access to sufficient water of, of suitable quality and quantity in all our, our plants and, and uh, uh, areas in which we operate. So the, uh, the the view we have of, of water is one essentially that we are a one of the players in a in a shared uh, resource system. Obviously, we recognize that we don't operate in, uh, in, in in any kind of islanded state, and we are we are faced with the same challenges as our our neighbors in that community, whether it you know, be here in Joburg where I'm sitting right now, or anywhere else in the country. And these risks we look at as uh, multivariate, right? That that they can take many different forms. Obviously, people are familiar with the headline stories that have made the news in the last few years. The, the cases such as Cape Town's Day Zero, or more recently the the drought issues in the Eastern Cape around Nelson Mandela Bay, and of course those are those are acute and and and, and um, serious supply side issues, right? But there are other risks through the supply chain that may also impact not only us but um, the water users. And uh, without um, you know without going too deep into to any of the detail, they can. They can obviously affect us not only from that that acute uh, scarcity issue in the in the in the uh, example of a drought, but also through assurance of supply, and then you start moving into the the scope of where infrastructure is, is significant for us and the business and and obviously the the communities that we we exist in. So assurance of supply, so not only access to the right amount of water, but when it's available, of course, is is significant for us. We also take a view on quality risks, uh, where there might be uh, direct risks to our people or our products on site. So we we need to respond to those risks with an extremely high standard of uh, internal governance. So 
we we need to ensure that any water that is used either as an ingredient or as a processing aid in the manufacturing of our products meets the highest quality standards and and we you know we're fortunate in that regard um to not only be part of a large organization that we can we can share and borrow from best practices and look to to global best practices even with regards to uh safety and quality controls internally but also and to to you know to give credit to the department and the work that it's done around uh, particularly the blue drop reports to give us a view of what our system risk might be so that's a really important piece of information for us and a reference that we do we do depend on so it's uh, it is appreciated and it's uh, uh, it is part of our consideration when we you know when we address our potential uh, water security or, or uh, quality risks um, and then ultimately, the manifestation of these risks, of course, from a business perspective, if I put uh, that hat back on, is uh, what does it mean for us at the end of the day? So over and above the the the, the principal risks of 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 health and safety uh, to you know to, to our, our people and our products, there are of course considerations we may need to make on um, on potentially uh, addressing intermittent supply or lack of supply or uh, any of the, the the quality risks which would require investment or further overheads and you know potentially have implications for uh for the business and its operations model uh which you know are unanswered questions but I'm sure people you know people in similar situations would would be very aware of that these uh these risks can't be ignored and as the as the the, the trend continues right and as we we forced to confront a, uh, a a reality that is um, that is challenging. We need to make decisions around how we address that. Uh, so, so the, the the impacts there on the business, some of this, the the immediate impacts would of course be the responses on on additional or potentially additional onsite treatment or uh, further sanitation controls in in our facilities. But further than that, the company is committed to trying to be a positive water actor. And extend our impact beyond our fence line. So we have a three-legged approach to water stewardship that the, the company is committed to globally. The first covers operational water use efficiency, so effectively looking after how much water we use and operating to a best practice or a best in class efficiency in all our manufacturing facilities. It was declared, I think, just last week that the company's actually achieved globally its its uh, 2025 water reduction commitment, which was a, a reduction of 25 percent of our uh, of our 2015 baseline in terms of water use intensity. So that's I think that that really uh, shows the commitment that the company's made to to significantly reducing its water footprint. But that doesn't eliminate our risk alone. We we also look to make more water available in the local. Uh, watersheds or systems that we operate in. So we have a program, the second element of our, our water stewardship uh, strategy is a program that we refer to as replenishment. So essentially making more water available. In South Africa, that takes the form of uh, well, three different projects. So we have partnerships with conservation agencies addressing source water protection and, and the restoration of our uh, strategic water source areas. We've got four major projects in the country, one in the Greater Cape Town uh, Water Fund. Then we have three uh, projects in uh, on the eastern side of the country, one in uh, the Kotha, Lundkloof, uh, Sondags area, and then northern and southern Drakensberg uh, strategic water source areas. Those are targeting alien invasive tree species, uh, and uh, we, we look to make Essentially, but through the removal and restoration of the uh, natural landscape and uh, 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 source areas, make more water available from the supply side. Then we also have partnerships with uh, the Department of Basic Education and some local municipalities around the country where we're looking at losses in the municipal and, and some school systems where we've installed PRV, uh, pressure reducing valves, pressure management systems in, in municipal mains. So we look at, at any reductions we can achieve in uh, losses in those systems as contributing to our replenishment targets. And then similarly, similarly in, in some schools in, in, in two different cities, we partnered with nine schools to refurbish and upgrade ablutions of facilities. So A, fixing leaks where they may exist, but then also replacing and upgrading infrastructure uh, to 
to more efficient systems. So, so you know, changing from uh, uh, you know high flow taps to low flow fittings or to on demand flush systems rather than um, you know the old tip trays or continuous uh, flush systems. So, little things like that that we 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 try and uh, install that when added together have quite a significant impact on our um on our net water footprint so that that's the second the replenishment leg is the second part of our water stewardship strategy and then the third element is the adoption of the alliance for water stewardship framework uh, and that covers and brings together all the efforts around water stewardship and uh, allows us to measure ourselves against a global framework for becoming uh, as the company likes to refer to net water positive so that's our, our journey on water. Um, I hope I've managed to cover a little bit about who we are and the dependencies and risks that we do face. And then, yeah, what, we've, uh, what we're trying to do about it to, to positively contribute and impact water management in South Africa and elsewhere, of course. Thank you very much, Sean Powell. Uh, and, and, and thanks for, in particular, emphasizing the issues around the stewardship. Colleagues, we're going to go to the Q&A. And, &A. and uh, firstly, thank you to the folk who have participated. Uh, Putilla, Imieni, Tulani Nkosi, Karen Bosman, uh, Matthew Hills. And it's still open for others to participate. Some have been responded to directly by the panelists, but I, I'm actually going to pull even the answered ones, because I think they're really important for the for the discussion. So, so let me kick off with this. Um, Tulani and Kosi asked about how do you make it easier for the private sector to be a water provider, uh, uh, either of services or of water itself. And let me broaden that issue a little bit. DG, I want to come to you around this because the president in the twenty twenty Sona introduce the concept of independent water producers. If you like opening the door to this exploration, your department has a very interesting in experiment running in the DBSA that is exploring this idea in more detail, the water partnerships office. Can I ask you to please comment on this issue and what we can see going into the future? Uh, Digi, uh, you're on mute. I, I'm sorry, you're still on mute. Sorry, Deshikan, can you repeat the question, please? I'm going to be a Q&A. Uh, yeah, yes, you did. Uh, but I just want to repeat this and, and broaden the scope. I'm saying that uh, the broader issue around private sector participation in, in yes. water in South Africa, uh, and I... I mentioned the 2020 SONA, where the president introduced the idea of independent water producers and yes. also the experiment that you're running in the DBSA with the Water Partnerships Office and, and ask for your further commentary yes. about it. Mm. Okay, good. So the, the challenge in this regard is to bring bankable projects to the market. There is no shortage of uh, private sector finance that would like to find a home in the water sector. The banks and the pension funds are queuing up to be able to invest in the water sector because they see it as a relatively safe investment. The challenge that we have is to, at municipal level is to bring bankable projects to the market. At the national level, in terms of national water resource infrastructure, we already have a very high level of private sector financial involvement. We currently have over 100 billion rand worth of projects in the implementation phase national water resource infrastructure projects, and over 60% of that is financed by the private sector. The entire Lesotho Highlands Phase 2 project, 43 million, is financed by money raised on the financial markets. The Umkamazi project, million, will be fully financed, will be partially financed by uh, funds raised on the financial market. The challenge is at municipal level, where there's a very low level of of private sector involvement. And we think that part of the problem here is that the current uh, PPP regulations in terms of the Municipal Finance Financial Management Act result in a situation where it takes too long uh, and is too expensive to do the feasibility study to get all the approvals to bring a project to the market, bankable project to the market. 
Um, the good news is that we end the discussions with Treasury. They've agreed to work with us um, to uh, partner with us in our water partnerships office that you mentioned to go to the particularly the metros where there's sustainable opportunities for private sector involvement and fast track some of these projects, particularly in the areas such as non-revenue water and get the necessary treasury approvals as part of the process without going through the, the very lengthy PPP processes. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Paul, I'm going to come to you with a question from Cameron Bosman. I mean, one of the things she raises is that, yes, of course, there are technical restrictions around many of the things that we're talking about. But beyond that, it's also going into areas that we don't often think about inside the space, like procurement at local level being a really big challenge around the efficiency of moving projects, sometimes critical projects. How are the folk at EWC are thinking about this, around this expanded team to make water work, if you like? Thank you for the question. And that's a um, very important question, because again, when we talk about skills, often we just limit it to technical capabilities. Um, in my discussion earlier, I talked about policy setting. Um, that might not, that doesn't require an engineering uh, qualification for you to understand setting policies and interpretation of policies. I'm um, also touching on what Sean just spoke to right now. Um, there's significant amount of investment that's sitting in the private sector. But if do, and the question is that do we have the capability in the public sector at Munich's level to be able to transact between these two parties? Um, and if you don't have a good understanding of the MFMA or the PFMA, you're going to find people stuck in, in compliance mode. Um, and this is where you find procurement, which is SCM, limiting infrastructure procurement because of capabilities or limited capabilities within that space. Um, another one is trans, and I'm going to talk about transitional thinking and transformational thinking and integrated thinking. Um, it might not be taught in an engineering qualification, but the ability for people to recognize that we are transitioning in different spaces. Um, I saw a couple of questions in here that talk to um, um, the, the content of hormones in, in, in what we eat. That requires different planning. It, you cannot exclude uh, leadership in the manner in the municipal space uh, from understanding. They need to take those things into account when they're doing their planning. So there's a, a, a bigger requirement beyond technical capability. And this is why EWC focuses on um, management development and executive development. And a lot, what we focus a lot there is strategic thinking, understanding of ESG, even right now, do we understand ESG as we put our plans together at and IDPs at municipal level? When we talk about our procurement plans, when we look at even the infrastructure maintenance, do we consider some of the things that are now affecting um, water quality and our infrastructure materials, the materials that are being used in infrastructure? Do we understand some of those things? And that often is not technical capability. So we do have, we do, from a CETA perspective, we are not list, limited to technical. We do bring in procurement training. We do have SCM. Um, I think the important one that we focus on is project management. There's a lot of projects, especially infrastructure projects, that get stuck. And often it's because SC we are bringing SCM into play to lead project management. Procurement of space. We see this in the energy sector too. Procurement of space becomes a, a long-term procurement for a spare part that's required today. So, and that requires agility, that requires people who are thinking constantly, people who are not, people who are not problem solvers, but who are solution orientated. And that for me is a skill um, that we need to look at. How do we embed this um, within the water sector? Brilliant, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Bertus, uh, Celeste Kurtzman, Kurtzen, that's a pretty specific question uh, of you and asks about the Olifant's management model program, a 27 billion rand project. What is the progress and what can South Africa learn from this? Uh, you're on mute, sir. Thank you. <laughs> it seems we all struggle with the mute. Uh, 
this program, the first project has been completed. Uh, it's a 400 million rand project. It will be uh, its practical completion and it will be fully completed in the next three weeks. Uh, the next big uh, portion is a 7.5 billion rand project, which is the pipeline from the Flag Bishilo Dam uh, to Mokopani and 30 kilometers beyond, as well as two treatment plants. That project is construction ready. Uh, we are finalizing the funding uh, from both our uh, partner sites, be it the uh, government site, as well as the uh, um, commercial site. Uh, so it should be able to go into construction in July of this year and for a period of approximately two years. Uh, shortly after that, we will follow with the next portions of the uh, project, which is specifically then uh, the, the other big um, uh, raw water pipelines but as well as uh, water provision to the communities around the pipeline. In total, it's approximately a, uh, between an eight and 10 year program. We need to understand at the moment with uh, commodity prices where it is at the, uh, and it fell significantly, that it is a challenge for uh, both sides, commercial and government, to uh, make sure that the funding is in place and that the program can continue as it as it will. I think it's, uh, you know, in terms of this process, the funders like uh, the commercial banks are, as Sean has said, uh, very supportive and uh, they are uh, in a process of finalizing the due diligence process and thereafter uh, hopefully we will be ready and funds available uh, from July. From a government side and I must give them the credit, they are actually ahead of the commercial user side uh, because they have already approved a significant portion of the funding. We, the last portion that we're waiting for is also the, the infrastructure fund uh, loan agreements, uh, and then it, it can go. I think in terms of the process that we follow, what we can learn from that is that it is a collaborative uh, partnership that can uh, be set up far faster than the normal PPPs and that it is ideally situated to make sure that uh, all service uh, uh, delivery uh, uh, services can be included in, in this type of model, which include things like uh, electricity, logistics, water, obviously, and others. The, the other important thing for us is this can be seen as a pilot for South Africa and that uh, as soon as this uh, program is fully uh, in implementation phase, I think we will see more of these uh, opportunities coming to the front. Thank you, Bertus. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let me now move to Sean Powell. Sean, you, you made the, the case around, well, one, needing water of a particular quantity and quality, and two, some of the work that you're doing inside around increasing your efficiencies so that you have a higher assurance of water availability. And then went outside and said you do work outside the factory fence. Let me explore that just a little bit around your stewardship. And combine this with some of the the questions in the chat, uh, for example, from from Yaki Petzer talking about whether or not we're taking advantage of the new technological space and and the implications of the four IR. In in the work that you're doing, uh, do you not see the opportunity to uh, pilot 
some of these new innovations that we really find critical, like um, higher water efficiency systems, ablution facilities that maybe use no water at all. I mean, South Africa is a leader in the Gates project around reinvent the toilet. Is this part of your strategy? Is this on the radar? Absolutely. Uh, so every, you know, every innovation has a place. It's not necessarily the solution for every problem. So that's there's a slightly different way that you need to look at and understand that if we're going to implement something that it is actually addressing the, the local issue that we have. Right. So in terms of our internal operational efficiency, we, we do our best to keep up with best practices and all the available technology. But obviously, we um, we we are we are not ourselves necessarily in the in the um the, the development process of these technologies. But what we do have is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, an enormous footprint. So we've got the in the fortunate position to be able to share best practices globally and to work with uh, both internal and ex external experts in specific processes, be it in um, you know, potato processing or uh, w whichever part of the, the, um, the, the manufacturing chain that we, we, we identify an opportunity and we can very quickly then cross-reference where there would be a good fit for that optimization. Uh, we've just actually shown uh, recently in the last quarter of last year how uh, making a simple change on our, our, our corn lines led to an approximately, well, that was one of the interventions, but, but just uh, tweaking optimizations on some of our, our, our processing lines, but led from a, a best practice on, on, on the corn systems uh, helped reduce our snacks efficiencies by a further 10% in the last quarter of last year. And that was very quickly rolled out from a, a pilot in in, uh, in North America. And so we can we can lift and shift is the, the term that uh, PepsiCo uses. And and that's that's something that we like to to do as often as we can, right? We 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 um we sort of uh, we are hungry for new ideas and opportunities, and I think the, the the core reason for that is because the commitment has been made by the business, right? The question is not what we're going to do; it's how we're going to achieve it. And so the how is the more important part, and that's where we do look to to these best practices and opportunities. Um, outside the fence is a little bit more more difficult, right? Because we're not necessarily we we're, we're not the, again we're not the only player in those examples, so. Uh, what is best practice is a collaborative decision that's made with the other stakeholders in each case. So yes, we know you know there might there might be better best um, best practices or a, a an ideal uh, case um, uh, reference that exists in the market, but it may not be appropriate for the. Uh, the environment that it is going into or um, or the specific area that we are working in. Um, and again, right, we need to consider the needs of the, be it the schools or the municipalities or the communities that depend on the environments where we where we might be clearing trees. Uh, they are, they're not uh, passive landscapes that we can just go into and, and you know, and, and parachute um, technologies or, or uh, uh, um interventions into we have to collaborate on what would be a solution for everyone in that in that space so as much as yes we would love to do more around um, implementing these best practices we do need to test the merits for all stakeholders and make sure that there is a benefit for for everyone obviously with water as the the, the key reference and and um, a nexus point that we all uh, consider Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Colleagues, I'm going to do one more very quick round of questions before giving you the opportunity for your closing remarks. Okay. Uh, so we want shorter, tighter answers because we are on the clock at this point in time. Let me begin with you, Gigi. Uh, one of the things that has come out in the chat uh, is the issue around the new regulatory environment that will govern uh, water services authorities, uh, the local authorities. And the specific question is, are you going to define, either from government or from elsewhere, minimum qualifications and, and competencies for people in different positions? But I have a second question as well, which I'd like you to just uh, say a few words on. How big a change are we expecting around the National Infrastructure Agency? Uh, what is it going to mean for the landscape? Uh, a quick answer from you, sir. 
Thank you very much. On the first question, we do already uh, regulate minimum competencies and qualifications for certain municipal officials working in water and sanitation. So, for example, we in our norms and standards for water services, we stipulate that a municipality with a water treatment works or wastewater treatment works of a certain size must have a certain number, a, a minimum number of process controllers with a certain level of qualification. We're in the process now of extending those minimum competencies and qualifications to higher levels as well, including the managers of water treatment work. Mm -hmm. So just uh, doing that and publishing the, the norms and standards and the regulations isn't necessarily sufficient. We, we need to answer the question as to what do we do if the municipalities don't comply with them. And in that regard, our amendments to the Water Services Act that we've published give us more teeth as a regulator. Um, to um, in the National Water, in terms of the National Water Act, um, we can do things like um, if someone is polluting the water resources, um, say a, a mining company or a manufacturing company, we can go, if, if they refuse to address it, we can go and um, have it uh, addressed and then charge them for it. Uh, we can also, um, the National Water Act also identifies certain things with criminal offences, which the Water Services Act doesn't do. So we, our amendments also uh, strengthen our regulatory hand in that regard as well with regard to water services. With regard to the National Water Resource Infrastructure Agency, its focus, as its name would suggest, on national water resource infrastructure. And our primary aim of creating it is to enable us to raise more finance for national water resource infrastructure. As I indicated earlier, already most of the uh, national water resource infrastructure projects are financed by the private sector. And it's done through our entity called the trans and Tunnel Authority. Uh, that TCTA doesn't have much of a balance sheet. It doesn't own any assets or have its own revenue streams. Um, so it can only borrow on the basis of explicit guarantees from National Treasury. And those guarantees from National Treasury are limited. Um, so we are going to the NWRA will be a bit like a sand roll for the water sector. We're going to transfer ownership of the dams to the NWRA, just like ownership of the National Road Network was transferred to sand roll. And the NWRA will then own those assets and have all the revenue streams associated with those assets. And we hope it will quickly establish a good reputation in the financial market. Thank you, thank you very much for that. That sounds transformative, actually, uh, and something to look forward to. Uh, and Paul, uh, there, there are a vast number of questions for you. I think you're going to have to organize for EWC to have a specific seminar. But let me pull out one in particular. Uh, and, and I can't remember the name of the person who asked it. They asked about whether or not the activities that you have will have a beneficiary base in rural areas. Uh, thank you. I did see that question. I'm going to try to link it with another question that is asking about the uh, whether the what are the skills that are required in the country for the water sector. Um, so from a rural perspective, we do have a number of um, uh, initiatives um, in the rural areas, but uh, also just to highlight that EWCTA will not implement programs on its own. Um, it's often looking for part water partners within the space. So in our rural communities, most of the partners that are there are municipalities and often dysfunctional municipalities where the, the treatment works aren't, aren't functional. Um, and therefore partnering with such and placing students in such areas uh, creates, which is what we used to do in the past, is really churning out beneficiaries that are not ready to even do anything within the sector because they all they've been exposed to is dysfunctional um, assets and therefore they end up sweeping their assets. Um, they can finish their term in training and therefore important is to have proper industry players that are driving skills development um, and not just drive um, initiatives and in communities for the sake of, um, of, of of involving people in communities because it's a, it's a bit unfair to put young people in class for three years and 
post three years, that piece of document can't give them access to anything within the sector. Um, so we're looking for partners within the water sector to say what are the initiatives we can implement in the in the rural areas. One of the big things that we are doing is obviously awareness of water carriers within the rural spaces. A lot of young people are not aware of the water carriers. They don't know the water pathways. Um, and so we need people who have been in the water sector um, who we can bring sexy back into the water sector when it comes to, to the young people so they can register into those courses. Um, so we give lots of bursaries for young people in the rural areas, especially where there's a lot of challenges. But what we are finding is that once they are qualified, they leave these spaces. They go and find work in the cities where they can use their qualification. So it's, it goes back again to where is the work going, go, going to be done? It's in the municipalities. If we don't ask, so someone asked about, I think there's a comment that spoke to training politicians and training um, councillors, training municipal managers and CFOs. If we don't sort that out from a water business perspective, and we're not going to, we are going to be trying to inject beneficiaries into spaces where there's not much room for them. So that's that's in the rural areas. It's really that. I'm um, also uh, listening to Sean Powers. Um, the water, the fact that there's no water in schools create an opportunity for young people to be creative. So the question is that how do we also just partner with the private sector to to bring these initiatives in schools so that the school itself, the young people, and they can come up with solutions for their own schools and assist them to implement those. And this is creating a pipeline for water um, excited uh, people that can serve municipalities and uh, most of the water services authorities in our country in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mpo. Uh, Bertus, can I come to you, please? Uh, you, you have an interesting model that's working at Lavalelo. Are you sharing this enough with the other water user associations? Is there a pipeline uh, of WUAs that are wanting to experiment with these new corporate governance and ownership structures? Thank you, uh, Deshna. Uh, I think what's happening at the moment, everybody is looking at uh, Lebelelo as the first of a kind. And uh, as soon as the, the projects are starting to happen, there will be more interest. At the moment, there's, there are a few uh, interesting entities, one being a water uh, project in uh, the Cape, uh, Northern Cape, as well as a electricity uh, user association that want to establish uh, in Limpopo to support the uh, making use of exactly the same model. But it is a new model and for uh, most of the mining industry and government, it is still, you know, you have to prove uh, that it is working. Mm. No, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Sean Power. Uh, what is the future of water stewardship for PepsiCo or South Africa? What are the next big things on your radar? Uh, well, the next best thing is obviously contributing to the global achievement of the balance of the 2025 commitments, which would be in uh, in PepsiCo terms, we've defined high water risk facilities as, as inheriting the, the, the majority of uh, the, the water stewardship commitments. And those are specifically the the water efficiency reductions, 100% uh, replenishment of our operational water use, and then the full adoption of the AWS standard. So as I mentioned, we've actually overachieved on the efficiency uh, metric, but we are still pushing in that regard. So we have internal stretches to take it even further. Given the context in South Africa, we recognize that we, you know, we do exist in, a, in an extremely dry and, and water stressed country. So we have a, um, you know, we have an additional uh, effort in this country to to take the efficiency targets further. So the company overall has achieved them, but we are still pushing to to take it further. And then uh, the the balance of our commitments is also uh, still to be achieved. We we are um, contributing to the global achievement of 100% replenishment as well. So our IAP projects and municipal and schools projects are are, are adding up to achieve 100% replenishment locally, and that is 
And that's contributing again to the, the global achievement of that target by 2025. And similarly, we are looking at, at uh, full adoption, so 100% adoption of, of the AWS standard by actually uh, uh, this year, we're chasing it uh, to be a year ahead of schedule uh, for all our high water risk facilities in, in South Africa. So we're pushing to move the agenda forward uh, on water stewardship in South Africa relative to the, the global commitment. And then the company will, will obviously review those achievements and decide what next, exactly what uh, shape and form uh, uh, and, and the detail of those commitments uh, will be. I can't speak to at this point, uh, but I'd, I'd say watch the space, right? I think we, we, we're privileged to be in a, in a position to, to lead in, in some of these areas. And yeah, the company will have uh, big ambitions following the, the achievement of the initial set of water commitments. Fantastic. Colleagues, uh, I know there are more questions, but we're going to have to draw it to a close. I want to give each of the panelists a chance for a closing statement. I'd like you to try to keep it to a minute if you can. A little bit of a spillover will be fine, but not too much. Uh, so why don't we begin in, in the reverse order uh, of which we started. Um, Sean Powers, can we begin with you? Uh, sure. Well, I don't really have anything much to add other than just to say that the company has a you know a strong view on being a positive uh, positive actor in the water space, right? So that means that we are actively looking to be a uh, be part of the solution. So you know the the call today was was uh, really focused around infrastructure, and we are entirely dependent on that infrastructure. And as we've demonstrated in some areas that we're also happy to to partner with municipalities and contribute to uh, to uh, improved sustainability of our, our water uh, management systems. So that that effort to be a, 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 a part of the solution is something that I'd like everyone to remember from this call and that yeah when you when you hear PepsiCo or you see any of our brands on the shelves that you remember that we are we're doing we're trying to play our part in this space and and although we you know we have significant risk as we've 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 mentioned earlier in the call we do want to be part of that solution thank you thank you uh Bertus. thank you uh I think it's important to note that this collaboration model is a innovative model that uh, still need to uh, ensure that it can be a proof of uh, concept and then rolled out further into uh, the water space. But just to uh, take it a bit further, with the resourcing agreement and sharing of resources that uh we have signed with our members uh there is uh quite a, a, a significant uh, support for municipalities that can uh, come from there also uh in terms of uh, oversight and utilizing uh, high tech uh, technology uh, to ensure that management of water systems and uh, detection of leaks uh, can be done on uh, basically from a remote uh, control room that is part of what we envisage to set up. Also, I think the fact that the amendment of the Water Services Act will open the door for more uh, support uh, and assistance to the municipalities where they are struggling with their water management, water maintenance, and uh, as uh, new water service uh, providers are coming in, uh, I think Levelelo in uh, the model we are using is ideally situated uh, to uh, participate in that specifically. The other important thing is that uh, Levelelo is also uh, doing quite uh, a lot of SED projects, specifically around schools, uh, SED, uh, SED, uh, SED, uh, ECD, sorry, ECD, uh, early childhood development centers, uh, 
primary schools and secondary schools where we provide uh, training facilities like uh, whiteboards, uh, solar power, and fiber connection. While we're doing our projects, it is uh, useful to put a uh, sleeve in the same trench as the pipeline and then later just uh, uh, blow your fiber connections through. So that is a huge opportunity, especially in the rural areas where you need to ensure better uh, connectivity for the schools in the, the area. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mr. Birmat. And Paul, I'm going to go to you next and uh, give DG the last word. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, mine is a plea um, to the water sector. I think there's enough money in the country to train, to build capabilities. There's enough brains in the country to plan and to um, transfer and to teach others who have, have who haven't um, have an opportunity to be trained and to be capacitated. Um, I'm going to ask this. I'm asking the sector. The government has put in place a process to collate skills needs for the country, for the water sector. And that, unfortunately, the sector has made it a compliance exercise. Um, annually, I go to the sector and we get work skills plans that are coming from the sector, which in that work skills plans, water companies are indicating the critical skills that are required. But often what is submitted to me is really a compliance PDP. That mentality of compliance is the same mentality of compliance we are seeing in the municipalities, which we do not like. So my plea is that let's strive the knowledge, understanding of the skills demand. Let's participate in that meaningfully because that informs qualification development, that informs where money goes. That's for me the ask is that let's work together and sort of shift away from that compliance mentality and really inform the skills that are required to shift South Africa into the space where we're changing the water narrative for our country. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mpo. Uh, DG Phillips, the word, last word's yours. Thank you very much, Deshikan. I would just like to thank uh, Krama Media and all the other um, sponsors of this webinar and yourself, Deshikan, for facilitating it. Um, we need to have much more of this kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Quite often in the media, the discourse around the water issues is a bit superficial. And mm -hmm. um, I've been very pleased to see the, the, uh, the level of this discourse in this web webinar, the level of detail we've gone into it, uh, and um, the level of knowledge amongst all the participants. Um, we need to raise the awareness around all the issues in society in general. That's important so that citizens can properly hold their government to account so they can be well informed. But it's also very important for us because for some of the key things that we need to do to ensure water security in the country, they can only be done in conjunction between the government and society. Um, so we need to develop a common understanding of the, the problems and the best solutions to them and then move forward. For example, if we're going to uh, get water to be treated more as a scarce resource and increase awareness mm -hmm. around that and, and decrease wastage of water, mm -hmm. it, we can only do that in conjunction with civil society and the private sector. It's not something that can be done by government alone. Thank you. Thank you so much, DG, and thank you to uh, Bertus and Impo and Sean Powers. It's been a really interesting conversation, and you are right. The conversation around water that happens in the media is a very difficult one. But I think it's clear from this seminar that the water team at large, the water department and its partners are hard at work. Uh, there's a lot of thought going into where we can be in the next little while. And my, 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 parting, uh, my parting thought to share with the audience is that, yes, South Africa is a water scarce country. The reality is that three quarters of the country in the world on the back of climate change are going to be water scarce countries. So both for the South African players, but maybe more so for the global players, this is the place to pilot the climate resilient solutions to get sustainable water security in the wake of climate change. And I think we must be selling this message a little bit more and getting much more investments 
on the possibilities that exist not only for South Africa and its neighbors, not only for this continent, but for the world as a whole. Thank you all very much for your participation. I am a grateful facilitator, and I will now hand over to Shannon. Thanks, Desigan. That brings us to the end of the discussion. Thank you to our facilitator, Desigan Naidu, for enabling this engaging discussion. Thank you also to our panelists, Mpo Mukupele from EWCTA, Beatrice Biedman from Lebolelo Water User Association, Dr. Sean Phillips from the Department of Water and Sanitation, and Sean Power from PepsiCo. Thank you to our sponsors for their support in making this webinar possible. They include the Energy and Water Sector Education and Training Authority, Lebolelo Water User Association, Xylem, m and Construction, the South African Plastic Pipe Manufacturers Association, Press Tank, Enterprises UP, and GLS Consulting. This webinar would not be possible without their support. And finally, thank you to the attendees for taking the time to join us for this discussion and for contributing your questions to the Q&A. We hope that you found this event engaging and informative. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you soon. And if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at creamamedia.co.za. Our next webinar takes place on the 10th of April, 2024 at 2 p.m. And we'll be discussing the growth potential of tailings, retreatment and rehabilitation. The link to register for that event has been shared in the chat. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us and goodbye.